Sam, I'm calling. I love the show. Thank you. Um, I'm calling to get a little more dystopian on you. Okay. I think we desperately need another Josh Fox who will focus on the energy consumption side of the story. And by that, I specifically mean car culture and suburbia and how the reality is that the vast majority of Americans who live their daily lives walk out of the house where they live and get in the car to go do everything, you know, buy groceries, go to work, go to the doctor, whatever it is. And uh, the answer is not to build, in my view, some more uh, energy-efficient car. I just think that that's not plausible, Uh, nor is it to just put in bike lanes everywhere, which is what the city of Madison has done, but to directly take this on. And I know you've had uh, James Howard Kunkler on in the past about who has written about this, but his tale is so apocalyptic that I think it just blows everyone away and so the conversation doesn't happen. But anyway, I, I, I think we need that, and then I'll, I'll just add this note. On the political side, I remember how, and I'm, I'm certain you guys do, how during the, the election there was this one debate where somebody asked about the price of gas, and the conversation just became ridiculous. About so, all of the above anyway. or something like that? I mean, I'll finish that. Well, what uh, are let your me, thoughts about this? Hold on. Well, let me ask you one more question. Um, if you've got a suggestion on a, on, a, on a guest on this, I mean, there was a guy who I... <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> there was a guy I interviewed, uh, and I, his name, Covell, I think it was. Um, was it Joel? Joel, Joel Covell. And he, uh, he was a, a Green Party candidate for president, I think against, uh, it was against... Um, Nader. He ran Nader. against Nader. And uh, I had him on the show, I think, uh, back in the Cedar on Sunday's uh, days, and he had done a film based upon a book of uh, his, I think that was called The, the Really Inconvenient Truth, and had done a, a film, and it, and it was, frankly, sadly, not a very good film um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of a film. But the point was is that he took issue with, with, with the notion of the, the whole idea behind The Inconvenient Truth, which was that, um, y- you know... You need to uh, you need to switch out light bulbs and this and that, and um, you need to um, do uh, small things uh, in your everyday life to reduce consumption in some fashion, uh, as opposed to major a a full scale understanding of that we have to change the way that we consume, the way that we travel, the way that we function, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, and in, in that. We need more government policy. This is not a question of individual morality. This is a, a question of of government policy. I mean, I um, and, and and I agree with with that. Uh, it, but I don't agree that it's going to have to be that individuals are going to have to make the choice to do this. I mean, we're going to have to have a major government policy. And frankly, the reason why it's so hard to find individuals who are, are talking about that at this juncture, as opposed to getting <clears throat> apocalyptic, is because it is so hard to even have, there's almost no space, no oxygen for that argument. Uh, that there is a sort of a, a genuine, large-scale response to... Uh, to global climate change uh, that is even sort of you can even argue about at this point and because in, in part because um, those forces that want to deny global climate change because of their own profits um, are so successful and the pre-existing desire for people not to say like I'm not going to drive uh, places, or I mean, um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, whatever it is that consumes energy. I mean, that is our whole 
sort of, you know, that is our birthright uh, in this country, to consume. Uh, that's what we were told to do after 9-11. Um, I mean, that is, that, that is the, the problem. But, I mean, if people have suggestions, uh, by all means, e email me at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Uh, and, you know, that said, I, you know, the problem with, you know, just raising cafe standards um, and having hybrid cars is that we and recycling and stuff like that is that we feel like we're genuinely doing something when in fact um, I don't know that we are or maybe we're mitigating things you know but on a level that may be more problematic just because of the impact that it has on our psyche as opposed to the impact it has on slowing global climate change. I think it's interesting though I mean I think you were kind of alluding to this though that that the the more radical suggestion about us significantly changing our lifestyles so that we live in a less all-consuming way. And then on the other hand, the kind of like, it's fine, just bring your bag to the grocery store, recycle, drive a Prius, whatever. The, the burden on individual behavior is so disproportionate from the real macro forces that drive this stuff. Policy, clo corporations, trade... On that level, I mean, those things do need to be addressed pretty fundamentally, way yes, beyond lifestyle. Here's the problem, is that, you know, the when environmentalists talk about this, that there's always the accusation that what you really want to do is simply change the way, the way America works. You want to get rid of capitalism. And on some level, that it is at least arguable that, well, on some level, yeah, uh, that may be the only real legitimate response. Now, with that said, um, I've heard Josh Fox argue, we didn't have time to really get into it, but I argue quite eloquently that we already have the renewable sources uh, that we need to, in, um, in many ways, uh, diminish our reliance on, on uh, hydrocarbon fuel. Um, and, and urban design questions and density and walking places versus driving places. Yes. I mean, a lot of these things, you know, again, I know Amory Lovins is another guy who says that all the time, and I don't have the wherewithal to judge all of these things, but he obviously, but he does say if we just threw efficiency and renewables we're actually fully invested in, we could get there very quickly. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's hard to imagine that when you look at some of the great um, uh, sort of expenditures and projects that America has undertaken over the years, uh, that we could not marshal the forces to do this. Um, but again, you know, uh, Josh Fox explained, I think, one of the primary reasons why this is not happening, and that is because um, these hydrocarbon um, uh, energy companies own our government on a multitude of levels. And that's why, like, you know, you know, that's why, I like, the, the, one of the most infuriating parts of, 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 of talking with Josh and, and watching the film was the Ed Rendell thing. Like, I don't know how Ed Rendell, I understand how he gets on Morning Joe. But I don't understand how Ed Rendell goes on any program on that, uh, on MSNBC, and is taken is is considered a legitimate voice for anything other than just shilling for corporate America. Uh, there's plenty of other examples on that network, and you know, but it's it really is stunning. And and I think, you know, I I don't know. That's what infuriates me. He's probably the most brazen overall. But well, I was I was actually thinking that. I think, again, that's what's pretty amazing about what Bill McKibben's doing is he's kind of connecting those two things because he's making – he's giving you paths to activism on this that are – could this be is, really impactful. This is speaking about his divestment tour. Divestment. On college, can, uh, and even just that whole model that, like, you can take ownership of this issue in whatever way you want using this platform. And that's a meeting of lifestyle and activism that hasn't really been presented before. And I think that that's why that could end up being really important. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sort of the convergence of how, and, and particularly, you know, the, the, the question of, like, 
the insurance rates in Miami. It's sort of a dry topic, but the government is now in the business of having to insure all that, and you could be looking at an economic catastrophe and understand that the first people to suffer under an economic catastrophe, right, are, are low-income and middle-income people. And uh, when that convergence, when that understanding of this is also fundamentally a populist issue, because we have these corporations who are, again, it's one more example of socializing the costs. You know, when that methane that leaks off into the air, they're socializing the costs. We're going to be paying for that methane. This is not just a question of what's, you know, it's not cleaner. It's not just that it's not cleaner. We are paying for it in real dollar terms as well. They are socializing the cost and they are just privatizing the profits here. Um, that is the paradigm that if someone could had the secret app that uh, sort of makes that relationship congeal to where, you know, someone who is getting uh, does not have the services they want uh, from their government or does not have health care uh, or is suffering uh, from health effects uh, and understand that this is fundamentally an economic issue because the reason why your government can't afford or will not uh, pay for your health care or the reason why you may be suffering some health impacts uh, is a function of somebody else's profits. Uh, once that connection is made, the reason why um, you know you don't have clean drinking water is because of somebody else wanting to make profits, and essentially using your lack of drinking water as that's a profit that's a profit generating center for them. Not not protecting your drinking water makes more profit for them. Uh, it is the same. It is again the same dynamic of the uh, Ford Pinto. But in this instance, you know, uh, you don't see the, the, the fracking companies say, hey, you got a choice, clean drinking water or clean, uh, you know, uh, clean, uh, natural gas. What do you want? They don't, they don't, they won't make that deal, right? You know, the libertarians would say, well, you know, the real problem with the Pinto was not that it exploded. It's just that people didn't realize they were getting a discount for an exploding car. And the consumer should just make that choice.